All right, we got Jeremy up. Hey, everyone. Hello, Hello there. there. Jeremy. How's everyone going? Every day is a holiday. <laughs> Happy mm -hmm. Friday, right? <laughs> Indeed. So we got another CISO on tap. I always love getting CISOs because I think it's a different perspective that uh, than what the community typically uh, gets to interact with. Um, Liz, do you have Jeremy's bio pulled up? I did. And of course, since you asked that, um, I will have absolutely closed the window. But at high level, Jeremy has worked across, I say, different, uh, I say, thought leader is a good way, but you have advised and provided insights and been there, done that, and you have the t-shirt is one of the best ways of saying it. Um, and uh, Jeremy, I'm so sorry because I can't manage uh, multiple windows, but yeah, uh, vulnerability management, email security, incident response and security center operations are some of the high level things that Jeremy has uh, worked in is considered one of the leading experts. And, and yeah, from there, uh, I mean, it, Tenable, Mindcast, IBM, Gong, I mean, really, you're just a, you, you're up for a challenge, aren't you? <laughs> I always up for a challenge. I like, I like to keep it, uh, like to keep it fresh. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're going to turn it over to you and let you share some insights uh, from being in the hot seat at uh, currently you're with Threat X, correct? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Perfect. Um, good to go. Let me share my screen um, and then we can get going. Should see a blank screen right now. And then. Put this in presentation mode and everyone can see my screen okay? Good to go. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Uh, Liz, Bryson, and the entire site team, thank you again for inviting me to be a speaker today at the uh, Unicon uh, Purple Team event um, and webinars. So super excited to be here. As Liz mentioned, uh, my name is Jeremy Ventura. I'm currently the acting uh, director of security and also field CISO uh, for ThreatX. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about why ThreatX and also why uh, the topic of today's conversation. Um, but as Liz mentioned, just a little bit on my background. Um, so I've been in the industry for over a decade, um, master's degree in cybersecurity, and really worked a lot of different positions in a lot of different companies. Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of different change, even over the last decade, like I'm sure um, all of us have on this call, um, as organizations go through digital transformation, as we have global crises and potential war going on, um, all the way to just technology changing every single second and the threat uh, landscape changing every single uh, second. So it, it's been it's been a it's a great ride. Uh, as Liz mentioned, I've worked for a lot of different um, cybersecurity vendors, but also worked internal security as well. Um, so before ThreatX, my previous gig was uh, working for Gong. Um, if people don't know who Gong is or aren't as familiar, Gong is one of the leading AI uh, Zoom and Teams kind of recording companies. So uh, really big during COVID uh, when everybody switched over to Zoom and Teams and remote work. Uh, Gong is a platform that sits there, can analyze conversations, um, does have legitimate AI and machine learning capabilities to understand uh, people's conversations and transcriptions and um, a lot, a lot of cool stuff. And as you can even imagine, even working internal security uh, for Gong, a lot of conversations and questions around um, security, around privacy, about what's going on with the data. Um, and before that, I spent a lot of uh, time working as uh, for security vendors, as I mentioned before, companies such as Tenable doing vulnerability management, Mimecast uh, doing email security, um, IBM, uh, ReliQuest, a bunch of other companies that uh, you can see in my LinkedIn. But super excited to be here today. Um, and really the conversation of what I want to get going is where are we headed as an industry um, from cybersecurity, but also what is the new and upcoming threat um, that is really targeting all sizes and industries of organizations globally. And that's really around APIs and web application attacks. Now, web application attacks and APIs have been around for quite some time, not necessarily new, but what we're really seeing is the explosion in all these news articles of major, major organizations 
being breached because of either vulnerabilities or misconfigurations um, within their API architecture infrastructure. And so today, I know I've only got about 25 minutes, I'll be watching the clock as well. Um, but I want to go through a couple slides, a couple conversations about why APIs, why now, and what can organizations look for when it comes to red teaming, blue teaming, and then of course, purple teaming when it comes to API security. So with that being said, um, do want to do a quick shout out. I want to thank uh, Matt and Jimmy and Steve Beer for also inviting me. Um, I got to work with those two gentlemen. Matt is the uh, VP of sales uh, at Scythe, and also Steve is a uh, account executive. So shout out to the two of them. I know they're on the call listening. Um, I got to work with those two gentlemen uh, 10 years ago back at our first company that got acquired by IBM. So cool to kind of see the full circle come around and uh, be invited here today. So thanks, guys. Um, but as I mentioned before, I do want to talk and discuss a little bit about understanding what an API is. Um, now, I know most security folks on this call and our technology folks know what an API is. But every time I do some of these presentations, I always get feedback at the end. And it's like, actually, I had no idea how often APIs were used, actually really what their use case was. So I definitely want to cover that at a high level. Then I want to get into the threat landscape. And then, as I mentioned before, I want to talk about some of the best practices um, and use cases that we've seen for red teaming, blue teaming, and of course, in an ideal state of purple teaming as well. Um, so during the session, i uh, love to make this interactive. If there's questions in the chat, um, and I know we've got a Q&A session, uh, please ask away. But without further ado, let's get into actually, what is an API? So an API stands for, the actual technical name is an application programming interface. So you don't have to memorize that, but what the heck does that mean? So really what it is, is an API allows two systems or even multiple systems to be able to talk to each other, be able to communicate to each other. It's really a set of protocols, routines, and tools that helps organizations build software applications. And it allows these different applications to communicate, or like I mentioned, at a very high level to talk to each other, send information back and forth, right? The pushing and pulling of information. And why it's important is almost every business that has a website, which is pretty much every business, means there's some type of API in the background that allows that website to connect to other websites and consumers, right? To drive business. And ultimately that drives business revenue. And so we can see APIs really in a wide variety of use cases and purposes for businesses. Um, I mentioned before, it's all about typically sending data or functionality. Um, for anyone that's on the call that has worked for security vendors or does work for a security vendor before, typically, I know when I was in my sales engineering days, uh, APIs, when I thought of APIs, it was about integrations. How can I connect my tool to another partner in, in, within the ecosystem of a customer environment, right? So APIs are really, really widespread uh, throughout the world, throughout businesses as well. Now, I always like to leave people with examples. Like there's one thing that you can remember, but, you know, Jeremy mentioned all these kind of technical and non-technical things about what an API is, but what is one fun way to describe it? And I actually got to speak, I had a really cool opportunity um, to speak to elementary students about a month ago. And I had to explain what an API is to a bunch of seven, eight-year-olds. And so how did I do that? I thought about what is something that connects? And so I really thought about tentacles. When you think about like an octopus, right? And they have all these tentacles that are out there. How do they touch? How do they eat, right? They're picking up food off the ground, right? They can touch other fish. They can do other things. And so when you think about an API, really think about, I know it's funny, <laughs> but really think about uh, tentacles, right? The, the octopus itself is the application. It's what this thing is. It could be, for example, um, an, an app on your phone. It could be a website. Those tentacles allow that octopus to be able to move, to be able to eat, to be able to kind of swim throughout the ocean. That's the same thing as an API. The API is the connection point between multiple systems that allow, again, to accelerate your business. So um, I know it's an elementary, uh, elementary analogy there, but if I'd done that actually for a bunch of CISOs and professionals recently, and they're like, you know what? I'm going to remember that one. That one's a good one. So um, for everyone else, though, you know, how do we use APIs on a daily basis? And I really do think as humans, right, forget security for a second, as humans, as we go through our daily lives, as we go through the world we live in, we're probably interacting with hundreds of APIs every single day. And most of the time, we just take it for granted, right? It's part of our daily life of how we do things. For example, this morning, um, I live in Southern California. I was like, you know, is it going to be raining again today or is it going to be 85 degrees? And so I go on my Apple iPhone, I look and I click on the weather app. The weather app actually uses a bunch of different APIs to allow to connect to my actual location and data. And so through that, I'm able to gain 
instant and access information, not just where I live, but in any city, state, or country that I want to understand where the weather is. Another one is when we're booking a rideshare app, whether it's Uber, Lyft, or any of the other ones out there, when we're booking a ride-sharing app, the APIs that Uber, for example, offers its uh, riders is able to find location services, it's able to calculate the best route of how to get from point A to point B, and even the estimated time of, time of arrival is actually an API. And when we think about APIs, those are just two examples that we probably use on a daily, if not weekly basis of almost everybody. In addition to that, think about when you are at potentially um, at, a, uh, at a restaurant or you're uh, buying something maybe on like DoorDash or Uber Eats and you say, I want to pay either with Apple Pay, I want to pay with my credit card, I want to pay uh, with any other form of payment, uh, even maybe Bitcoin, right? Those are APIs. That's how we are able to transact and send data to make sure that our life is easy. So when you think about it that way, almost every organization, I, it's very hard to find organizations that don't use APIs or that don't know they're using APIs, um, are leveraging an API or multiple APIs to connect and make sure that at the end of the day, their business is operating at a very fast function to allow consumers to be able to access that information. Now, while that's all great, and I mentioned the word and the, you know, the marketing buzz of digital transformation, but from a CISO perspective, that's actually a real thing, especially in the last couple of years, as organizations have gone from this transformation of on-prem to really kind of going all in with the cloud. And when we do that, APIs also allow our development team to create products or to also accelerate the time of delivery for our organizations and software development teams as well. So APIs are great, but why are they the next frontier of cyber attacks? Well, it might be an obvious, but APIs are growing at such a fast and alarming rate in a good way, but also what's happening is organizations are losing from a security perspective. The key word here is visibility. I don't have visibility into all, never mind my endpoints, APIs. Because as a developer, I can create an API, it might do one function, and then I kind of set it and forget it. And then maybe it's just still out there. Maybe I didn't put the right protocols or security compliance guidance around that API. And that's what we're seeing. And I'll get into a little couple of uh, examples of data breaches and use cases that we've seen. But more times than not, we're seeing APIs being uh, attacked by hackers because of the information that they hold or behind it. As I mentioned before, from uh, an Uber or right from a weather app, the amount of information from uh, name, email, could be social security, could be uh, account numbers, it could be credit card numbers, right? The amount of information that APIs can lead to or APIs are sending over the wire or over the traffic is almost everything, right? It's really kind of the secret door and secret communication of how these businesses or applications run. And so it's a gold mine for hackers and attackers to be able to uh, penetrate and exfiltrate uh, these APIs. And so as we go through this, actually Gartner had just come up with a report. It was the uh, end of 2022, early 2023, that their prediction is by the end of 23, early 24. So coming up here in about six to you know eight months, APIs will become the number one attack vector of how organizations are uh, being breached or where incidents are occurring. So again, while business is running as we're relying more and more technology than ever before, which is all great, there also comes a huge security risk behind that where organizations really need to focus their time, effort, energy, and resources on how do I gain visibility and how do I protect my APIs from attackers. Now, with that being said, we're going to get into um, just a quick little recent story of what's something in the news. And by any, by no means, uh, I got a lot of good friends. Uh, I'm actually um, uh, very good friends with the security team uh, and multiple security members of different avenues within the T-Mobile brand. So by any means, this is not a call out uh, to T-Mobile. Um, this is all public information, but I want to highlight something here, uh, which is really important. At the uh, beginning of this year, actually not that long ago, T-Mobile had announced that uh, there was a data breach. And that breach was due to um, an API that allowed, so the API was accessible by the development team, but that API was left, again, without security controls and kind of just left out in the open. And a uh, entity, I'll call it, or a hacker, uh, was able to access that API and then be able to scrape 37 million end users data. Now, while some people say, Okay, what was the data? It was really name, email, you can see it here, phone, date of birth, account number. You know, is my information already out there? Probably. But without, without going into it too much, um, still the root cause was how was an attacker able to get 37 million records? 
Um, and they were in that network for between November and January that had access to this API before T-Mobile was able to shut it down. And when you think about some of the data, what you can do with that, right? API breaches allow organizations and hackers to be able to go after them in other means. Maybe it's email phishing attacks. Maybe they can go attack or probe another part of their network. They're learning, right? A lot of times these API breaches, while they may not seem bad on the service because, oh, they got my name, still, that what that's kind of uh, the root cause is going back to is there's so many APIs. These are major brands. So many APIs out there. Even these organizations are losing sight and losing visibility into what do I have? And those are some terms that we use in the industry called rogue and zombie APIs, meaning, or you can uh, even kind of, uh, consider it in like, if you're in IoT or uh, OT, shadow IoT, for example, but it's shadow APIs where we use that API six months ago for a project for do, to do one thing. And yeah, it's fine. Uh, you know, we left it. And then all of a sudden that API comes back and is actually the one that is the target of an incident or breach. So it's really important for organizations to gain this better sense of visibility, but also control about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what does normal look like. So again, this is by no means to call it T-Mobile um, by, by any means. But in addition to this, there is still information coming out even four months after the fact where, you know, what was wrong with the API? Was it something like a lack of visibility, as I mentioned before? Was it something from stolen credentials of that developer that allowed the attacker to get in? So more information to come. I'm sure we'll hear more in the news of kind of what happened there. Um, but T-Mobile, Peloton, Facebook, Twitter, USPS, um, there are many, many, these are global brands and these brands have all been affected here within the last 12 months of some major API incidents that have led to data breaches. And so, uh, I, not to scare anybody, no one's immune, right? And these are just major breaches. How about the small federal credit union out of Milwaukee, right? What are they doing? Do they have the resources to protect their application or their credit union from attackers from an API breach? And so it's becoming a real problem in the industry, uh, again, just because the, the pure, simple fact that digital transformation is happening and businesses are moving at light speeds. So with that being said, you know, when we look at some of the different types of attacks, you know, we talked about digital transformation, but hacking has also become easier than ever. Nowadays, I can go online on the dark net and do something called solver services. Solver services is hiring pretty much um, a program um, that attackers have created that allows me to go and crack or break through different solutions that are already out there, typically what we call rent-a-bot solutions. So for, I don't know, maybe $200, I can go on the dark net today, rent a bot or a botnet, and then send an attack out to a list of different organizations that these attacking groups have already known how to break in through for 200 bucks. And maybe I get some information back about names, email addresses, or maybe even more goldmine, PII information, for example. And so what we're seeing is hackers are starting to... Uh, uh, accelerate, but also gain revenue because of how easy it is sometimes to crack into some of these different uh, commercial tooling and vendors that are out there. Um, we're also seeing this kind of proliferation of attacking as a service. We talk a lot in the industry, I know there's some presentations coming up about ransomware and ransomware as a service, but even bots as a service or API as a service is becoming a real thing. And so with that, organizations typically and traditionally have focused on what we call the OWASP top 10, which is um, for everyone, it's uh, that doesn't know, OWASP Top 10 is a, a community out there that has created kind of like, here are the top 10 categories. There's a bunch of different top 10s and specific things. Um, and traditionally, up until this point, organizations just said, you know, I'm going to put, for example, a web application firewall out there, and it's going to focus on my API or my OWASP Top 10, and I'm good. Set it and forget it. What we're seeing is attackers are way smarter than that, not just from hacking and uh, doing this rent to the bottom service, but they're also being able to attack organizations from what we call these low and slow. Think of traditional for security experts out there, those traditional uh, APT attacks that we've seen, where it's low and slow and they're in a network for a while. Same thing. We're seeing API and application security incidents happening, uh, even T-Mobile, right? Two months. So over 60 days, that attacker had access to that and was probing around the network. We're seeing way longer than that. Two months is now kind of seeming unfortunately normal. And now we're starting to see six months, nine months, years where attacker has been inside of a network probing around with APIs or bots and going underneath that threshold. And what they're doing is they're combining all these tactics, techniques, and procedures together, right? The whole goal here is how do I evade detection to make sure that nobody um, can get caught, right? The security tooling I have in place isn't going to catch it. And unfortunately, just in the world we live in, uh, as I mentioned before, technology is changing faster than ever. And sometimes security tools that are out there in the space aren't necessarily keeping up. 
And so really, you know, the best practice here is making sure, and we talk a lot about this in industry in general, but having a defense in layer or defense in depth, right? Having multiple layers to stop the attacker, to be able to gain visibility, but also detect that attacker or those characteristics of an attack way up front and early. And so um, we have a lot to do as an industry, a lot to do as uh, provide our companies and organizations uh, the right tooling and technology and training on this. Um, but we are making steps, right? And I think that's the good thing, the optimistic thing that I want to leave uh, people with on this call. Now, I mentioned quickly bots. And why I like to always bring up a, a quick word about bots is because this is also another attack pattern that we're seeing attackers go after that we experience on a daily basis. Um, it's funny, I was just talking to a couple of my friends uh, that live um, in Tampa, Florida, and Taylor Swift, I'm not sure if anyone's called, Taylor Swift did a big concert last night there uh, at Raymond James Stadium. And I was thinking about as we were at the concert, man, how hard was it to get those tickets? Because I'm not sure if people remember, but Ticketmaster had a little bit of an issue uh, when Taylor Swift announced her world tour. Uh, there were a bunch of bots that were going after it and trying to gain tickets. Or think about when Nike uh, comes out with a new shoe, the new Jordan. Right. And it's like you only have uh, an hour and you got to wait in line to go get your uh, your new pair of shoes or order them. Uh, what's happening is we, we're seeing bots really uh, taking over, not just from a commercialized commercial uh, commercialization standpoint, but also attacking organizations in a bad manner as well. And the one thing I do want to be clear is there is a concept of um, good bots and bad bots. And. When I say bad bots, it's really the intent and the usage of who's behind that bot. So obviously attacking organizations, doing data scraping, trying to do uh, a, a DDoS attack or distributed denial of service attack to take down a website, bad, right? Good bots is really more the intention. Um, what I think is really interesting is a lot of people don't think about how many times just normal companies are using right, and brands out there are using bots against their competitors. Uh, we've seen this a lot in especially... Um, retail or commercial consumer products where I'm not, I'm going to say this story. This is not a hundred percent true. I don't know this, um, but I could make a guess. Uh, for example, I'll take just an analogy, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola may actually have bots that go undetected to hit Pepsi, for example, to see, you know, what are they doing as far as maybe a new product? Um, you know, what are they doing as far as are, you know, are they offering a new um, product coming out and it's on a, a certain website? We see this a lot. Again, I'm not picking Coca-Cola and Pepsi. This is an example. Um, but we see this a lot between competitors where they'll actually run SEO or search engine optimization bots against each other to see what are they doing? Um, is there coming up with a new product? Is Are they doing something new with a website? Um, and so are, are they, for example, is uh, a online retail store uh, doing discounts next week? Or did they raise the price of a, that t-shirt, for example? So we're really seeing bots uh, become really into effect when it comes to um, API security, but also web application security as well. So with that, um, one of the things I want to do is talk about quickly uh, tales from the field, and then I'm going to get into kind of the best practice and recommendations. Um, so here at ThreadX, ThreadX is an API security application security company. Um, so we do protect organizations and everything we're talking about. Um, but I do want to mention um, some real a real life attack that we just saw recently. Um, so we had a uh, online gaming company. So they provide websites that people can go and play uh, online blackjack, for example, or online um, craps or roulette. And what happened was this company was actually launching a new product. Um, what they discovered was uh, what kind of the timeline here was an attacker was actually probing, as I mentioned before, uh, using bots, uh, the APIs behind the scene. So companies coming out with a new website. It was a new uh, kind of Las Vegas style game. And it was on their development site. Uh, the the attacker was able to probe around their endpoints and find, oh, wow, there's a development site for this online gaming company. Let's go take a look at the endpoints. What's going on? Be able to probe around there. Now, they never went detected at first because they were never setting off a threshold or an alert at the time of the triggering. But what they were doing is finding weak holes or loopholes in the vulnerabilities and saying, hmm, that looks a little odd. Or oh, they're using this type of encryption or this authentication method, for example. So what happens when the company releases the new product and releases this new uh, Las Vegas style uh, gambling online on their website, uh, that attacker or attackers went after uh, the actual production website now and tried to launch a full scale attack um, using um, actually uh, credential stuffing. And so uh, using a bot. And so credential stuffing for anyone who doesn't know, lists of username and passwords typically solved in other breaches uh, can be sold in the dark net. And so now they're just hitting that website with username and password, username and password, username and password, trying to break in and gain access to it. Now, luckily here at ThreadX, right, even though that bot attack in the development, uh, they did not have ThreadX 
different story on the actual development site, but we had them on production. We were able to actually correlate all the information and data via IP fingerprinting, via TLS signatures, for example, to be able to correlate and say, that's the same tacker that you guys were mentioning earlier in the development cycle. So between this, right, I think when a lot of this, it really comes down to correlation of data. Attackers are getting smarter. They're getting faster. They're starting to learn how to evade detection and go kind of undetected stealth for a while. But when they go into a major organization and really attacking, having a security tool, having security partners and vendors, um, like a lot of us on the call, is very, very critical and key to also make sure that we're doing uh, effective threat intelligence information to stop those attackers as well. Now, I know we got a couple minutes left, um, and this is the fun part, a couple slides here. Um, so what does this all mean? So I will say red plus blue equals purple, and I know obviously we're here at the uh, the site conference, so I uh, want to give a shout out uh, to the entire site team. But you know, from a CISO perspective, what can organizations do right now from a red teaming uh, exercise or tips and recommendations, blue teaming, and then I'll get into purple. Um, so, you know, when it comes to red teaming, there's a bunch of different exercises that organizations can do from pen testing, right, to making sure we're doing vulnerability scans on our APIs and applications, looking at different things like authentication and authorization tests, making sure where they're weak um, in these mechanisms or using weak passwords, insufficient validation of these APIs. Um, in addition to that, we can also look at validation testing. So making sure we're checking for things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, making sure we're using the right encryption methods. So either TLS 1.3 now, uh, SSL, for example, rate limiting and throttling as well. So making sure that we're not setting, we're, we're setting up thresholds to make sure that we're, our websites aren't being peaked at a certain time and what's normal. And then of course, um, always training business logic tests as well. So from a red teaming perspective, those are just five simple things you can do. This list goes on forever. From a blue team exercise, right? This is where it's starting to put some of the right security tooling and processes and plans in place. So you can start with an API gateway. Um, API gateways aren't 100% bulletproof, but they do a great job of authorization and authentication. Um, in addition to that, talked about um, making sure we put the right type of authentication in there, such as using OAuth or other tokenizations like JWT tokens, um, encryption as well. So making sure we're looking at what is my API doing? Uh, is it sending over PII information or sensitive data? Um, can I mask that? Can I obfuscate that? Do I want to put certain encryption methods or a higher encryption level on those APIs to make sure that I'm keeping that uh, information secure as being pushed or pulled? Um, lastly, as well, um, the last couple is logging and monitoring, making sure we're always logging, monitoring, making sure we're understanding, again, gaining that visibility into what's there, um, making sure we're correlating that information and sending that information to the other ecosystem partners and tooling to make sure we're getting valuable insights. And then lastly, of course, uh, for organizations uh, looking into an actual API security tool. So what that really means is I kind of put that on the slogan at the bottom here. You'll hear a lot of organizations say, oh, we got to shift left. We have to shift left. Yes, but you also have to shift right. You have to understand what's already in production ev everywhere, right? How do I do real-time blocking? How do I make sure that if an incident occurred, I have the right processes and blocking procedures in place to mitigate that threat? So I like to say shift left, shift right, shift everywhere. Lastly, my last slide here is for purple teaming. So in the ideal state, what does a purple teaming look like? And I know we've, uh, you've probably heard a lot of different uh, talk tracks already about the effect of purple teaming and different avenues, but specifically for APIs, right? Threat modeling emulation, I cannot highlight enough. Um, I do think there's many times where, especially in API and application security, organizations are doing uh, pen testing of that red teaming exercise, but they're not either you know, up to date or they're not industry specific, they're not brand specific to my company, or they're not have, they don't have the current TTPs of kind of what's going on in recent attacks. Understanding past breaches, understanding kind of the TTPs of these different attacking groups, and then emulating that in real life into a simulation mode is super critical um, for organizations to collaborate, for organizations to be able to prioritize these threats and prioritize their APIs and applications, what to focus on first. Um, I mentioned tabletop ex uh, exercises as well, making sure that we have flexible plans, making sure you're bringing in the right stakeholders and you can do in continuously security modeling and learning throughout that. Um, last couple of things, we say this in every uh, aspect, cannot stress enough the amount of training, knowledge sharing, not just for um, your developers and engineers, but bringing the security team together with DevOps, right? Having that true DevSecOps, making sure that the CIO and the CISO and the CTO, but then HR and finance, they know what's going on. What is the most business, what is most critical to my business? What do we need to protect? What do we need to have eyes on glass on at all times? And lastly, I mentioned uh, kind of that continuously feedback loop around collaboration, making sure we have instant response playbooks um, that are flexible. That's my biggest thing. A lot of times organizations have IR plans, they sit there and they're sitting on a shelf for five years. 
right? And then they pull it out when an incident happens and it's not up to date, right? So making sure, again, this all correlates together. We're doing threat modeling, we're doing emulation, we're doing tabletops, and we have plans that actually map that, that can be flexible and incorporate everybody. So that is, uh, I think, right at time. Um, but I want to thank everybody again. Um, hopefully this was a good, quick presentation. that give a quick high-level overview of API security. Um, and Liz, I will turn it uh, over to yourself, Bryson, for any questions. Yeah, that's awesome. And thank you. And I really particularly appreciate the shout out and reminder to everyone uh, to loop in those business operations, uh, because one of the biggest uh, points of failure for business email compromise, for example, is your finance and your accounts receivable. And yes. So no, thank you so much, Jeremy. And one of the questions uh, that we had in the Q&A is, are there training and awareness programs that you would recommend to educate developers and other stakeholders uh, about the API best practices and uh, impact? Yeah, absolutely. So there is, um, the cool thing is there's a bunch of information out there um, and there's always this gap uh, I was asked this recently on the on the last webinar that I did of like, how do you get security and development to work together? And that's that's a loaded million dollar question that we don't have all the time for today to talk about. But um, there is absolutely online training. There is a, a lot of great resources out there. Um, I always say start with the OWASP. OWASP gives you a good fundamental breakdown of kind of what to look for. They just updated it probably like a month ago. So now you have the OWASP API top 10 for 2023 has been updated since 2019. So that's kind of cool to see. Um, in addition though, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, I know there's a gentleman, his name is Corey Ball. He provides API Security University training. I've seen a lot of people on LinkedIn, a lot of developers taking that. Goes from like kind of like a one-on-one -on -one class to two to three. Um, so there's a bunch of training out there. Some of it's even free. I know Tanya Jacob over at WeHack Purple provides free uh, purple teaming and security training as well for developers to kind of start to become familiar with some of the security practices and terms. And likewise, for security to understand development as well. No, that's great. And so one of the other questions is, would tools like Swagger help with reducing shadow APIs? Um, it would, it would. Um, but again, I think when it comes to shadow APIs, um, really focusing on, uh, a lot of people will even say, you know, web application firewalls, it'll pick up APIs, but a lot of these tools are, are single transaction. So they see something come over the wire, they transact it and say, is it good or bad? And then try to make a profile of that. Really investing into a dedicated API security tool will have different things about, um, uh, different things around cataloging, inventory, discovery, and be able to categorize because not just JSON or REST APIs, we're now seeing an explosion of GraphQL and XML. So making sure we can get a full picture and really API security, dedicated API security tools in that space are going to be the best bet to reducing that shadow API. Yeah, no. And would Honey Coupon Extension be an example of an API that uses bots to scrape data from online retailers? And then kind of a follow along, how do you, or how do end users ensure that their data is secure when using such tools extensions at uh, daily web browsing practices? Risk avoidance versus risk acceptance. Cool. Lo loaded question. I, <laughs> I will answer the first part. Um, the coupon extension. So yeah, there's a bunch of different like browser extensions out there. I personally even use a couple. I know sales teams use a bunch when it's like, uh, I know Hunters is another big one. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of different stuff. Yes, the majority of all those tools are all leveraging uh, APIs and or bots to scrape data from other online marketing resources or big these big third-party warehouses that have emails and names and uh, coupons or whatever it might be. So yep, that's, that's actually a perfect example of APIs and uh, how bots are used. Um, the second question, how do end users ensure their data is secure with tools and extension daily web browsing? So um, not just with API security tools, there's also web browsing um, uh, extensions or security tools as well to make sure that, especially in an organization setting, um, every organization is different, um, but there's also web app, uh, there's web web security products and vendors and tools out there that can do and wrap around a little bit more protection when it comes to actually browsing, making sure you're avoiding different things like extensions or uh, you know updates or things that get automatically downloaded, which is how a lot of times ransomware and a lot of times uh, how other major incidents happen as well. And lastly, so I need a web application API protection to protect against evil tentacles. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Yes, so WAP is Web Application and uh, API Protection. So uh, Gartner kind of came up with that term uh, a couple of years ago. 
That's only been out for about three years, I think, three, four years. Um, but yeah, there are a bunch of WAP vendors out there, uh, ThreadX being one as well, uh, that plays in that space. Um, but th there's WAP, but even sometimes with the WAP, I I'd be very, very cautious because a lot of times, um, a lot of companies and organizations really focus on the web application part, right? They're kind of existing as a, a, a kind of a next-gen WAF or a web application firewall. That's what that stands for. So still even looking into uh, specific API security can also uh, really start to kind of, again, put that uh, defense in depth and with multiple layers in there. Great. Well, thank you. And I highly encourage everyone to continue following uh, Jeremy's work and uh, research. And thank you so much for sharing with us today. Absolutely. And thank you guys again for having me here. And uh, everyone, thanks for joining. Happy Friday and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you for joining us, Jeremy.